Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, I appreciate you are coming here to listen to um, my story, and I have a story to tell. Uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, a serious problem, and hopefully I can make clear that it's not necessary to live with this problem. We can really tackle the problem, and that's what we are going to do tonight. And I'm going to introduce you in my thinking. Uh, on beforehand, I have to say that this thinking was very much supported by quite a few people here in this state. Um, and as the minister said, I've done this type of work in a few other countries more, but I really welcomed the way how they welcomed me and how open they were to me. And that's speeding up thinking. And um, I, would, I would really appreciate all the work they have done so far for me. Okay, let's start then. Um, here you see a part of the city I was born. And this is a city built centuries ago. And this city um, was a rich, was and is a rich city. Um, and as you know, we had this famous Dutch East Indies company. And they sailed around the world for several decades and the first multinational in the world, by the way. They sent a few ships to Asia and they were um, specialized in spice trade. They hit Australia as well, as you might know. And sometimes people, knowing that I'm from the Netherlands, know that a ship called the Duifken or a ship called Batavia pronunciated in Australian, of course. Um, you are familiar with Van Diemen's Land, and you are familiar with Abel Tasman, Abel Tasman, as you call him here. Um, and they brought a lot of money back to this city. And here you have a few examples of uh, houses built alongside Amsterdam canals. And here you see the scheme of the city. It's really designed using these canals. And these canals are still very famous. And here you see what's happening if the Dutch soccer team only wins the second place at the World Championship in South Africa. Um, then these canals are beautiful places to have this festivity um, uh, in the city. Um, and I ask your attention, and now coming to a more serious part, I ask your attention for the rail at the top of this slide. Do you see that rail? That little rail here? And perhaps you ask yourself, why do we have that rail alongside canals? And here you have the explanation. Do you see the cars parked at the left-hand side of that uh, picture? And it's simple like that. By this little rail, we prevent cars hitting the canal when they are parking. And we have these little rails alongside all canals. So you cannot say, I know a spot where a car hit the canal, so I put a little rail over there. Of course not. You, you surely know that you have to do that everywhere. And that happened. Before we killed a few people a year in these crashes, they drawn in the water. And now we have that and we solved the problem. When I was thinking about road safety in Australia, I came to this example. And here is the example of your country. When I arrived in the state, I saw these famous Stoby poles. And the big question is, why do you have these famous Stoby poles so close to a road? The best thing you can do is to stop before you hit one. <laughs> but basically, we have to get rid of them all. You cannot say, I, um, I uh, remove one. You have to remove them all. And I learned the story behind why you don't do that, but I don't think you can escape with that type of story. So please, do me a favor and think about how to get them being removed in the future. And it's very cynical to learn 
that sometimes the po these poles are replaced exactly the same way after killing a driver. That's pretty cynical indeed. Okay, first message. Um, here I have um, a, a Belgian poet, somebody from the Netherlands citing a Belgian poet. It's extraordinary, of course, if you know a little bit the history in Europe. But nevertheless, it's fully true, and it's, 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 it's my story. And it's a story for road safety. Between vision and action, there generally exist impediments of legal regulation and practical obstacles. And I see it as my task to deal with these legal regulations and obstacles, how to get them away in order to re reduce the, the death toll. These are the seven items I'm going to address tonight. And for a lecture is not unique, perhaps you recognize perhaps the pattern. I'm going to talk a little bit about the analysis, the vision, some introduction to actions and measures. I'm going to talk about cultural change, which is needed, in my opinion, in this state in order to make progress. Of course, I'm talking about implementation. My idea would be to uh, announce a few demonstration ideas, and then I have three simple conclusions. The minister was talking about this already. You made in this state, in enormous progress over the years, when it comes to fatalities and when it comes to serious injuries. These figures are fatal crashes and injury crashes. I believe it would be good to pay more attention to the problem of injuries and serious injuries. I have a figure here that road crashes are costing this state one billion Australian dollars a year. I do believe this is an underestimate. I've seen the way you make the estimate here, and here you can improve yourself a little bit. And my assumption would be that this figure would be something like 50% higher than this one billion. I'm not going into detail on that, but read my report about it. But it's more important to know that 50% of these costs are related to injuries. 25% are related to fatal crashes and 25% are related to damages. So 50% of these costs are related to injuries. You focus yourself in the state very much on the fatalities. And these are, of course, very serious. However, it would be good to pay more attention in all your communication and action to injuries. How are we doing in South Australia? And here I have the picture of comparing the different states. And as the minister said, um, there are a few better performing states. Not to speak about Canberra, of course, uh, but to speak about Victoria and New South Wales. And the question is, can we perform better? Can we do that? And if so, how? When I arrived, um, almost everybody was telling me road crashes are caused by extreme behavior. I learned, as I said somewhere else, the word hoon driving almost the first day uh, when I arrived here. I've never heard that, heard that word before, but nevertheless, hoon driving. And I ask myself, is that the full truth about road crashes in South Australia? And that's the reason why I asked um, Kasser, and that's, um, in my opinion, a very good research institute in your state, uh, to help me a little bit to better understand what's going on when it comes to crashes in this state. And here you have one of the results. So what they did, they went back to the coroner's files and tried to identify which of these fatal crashes in 2008, 2008 were caused by extreme behavior, far above the legal limit when it comes to alcohol, far above the speed limit, and where there can be talk about system failures. 
And here you have this 40, 60 percent. And if you go to injuries, it is not 40, 60, but perhaps 20, 80. I have still to study that, but nevertheless, um, it's even higher when it comes to system failures. It's important to understand here that the story told by fatal crashes are different than the story told by injury crashes. These are not similar crashes. And it's very important to understand these differences. And what I learned from the initial analysis until now is that uh, the percentage of system failures, and I'll explain you in a minute what I mean with that, uh, is higher than uh, for fatal crashes. So we have to understand that on the one hand you have these extreme behavior problems. On the other hand, we have these system failures, and both are important. And that's one of the messages I have. Don't only believe it's extreme behavior, it has also to do with failures of the system. If I talk about failures of the system, I go to an uh, English UK colleague of mine, uh, James Reason. He didn't study necessarily uh, road safety, but human behavior uh, in general. And what he did was to compose those five screens. Sometimes people refer to the Swiss cheese model. All these screens have holes in them. And these holes are latent errors. In themselves, these holes are not dangerous. They're not causing a crash. However, because we have these holes, a crash can occur if unsafe behavior related to these latent errors of the system together allow us for a crash. What we did in the past in road safety is paying a lot of attention to unsafe actions, risky behavior, and we fully understand that. But we learn more and more, not only in road traffic, but also elsewhere, that we have to change the system in order to uh, allow people to perform better. And that's basically what we try to do. Try to get rid of those latent errors. Have to accept that human beings sometimes make errors, sometimes they violate, but nevertheless, this will not result in a crash. So that's what I would like to say about the combination, combination of extreme behavior and human errors leading to crashes. Talking furthermore about the nature of the problem, we have to understand that it is a so-called multifaceted problem. It's not a simple problem because we have many aspects related to crashes, and I gave here a few examples. So it has to do with a combination of circumstances most of the time, it's seldomly one cause. The problems in the metropolitan area are completely different than in the rural or the remote areas. The problems of different transport modes differ. The problems of different age groups differ. So it's all differences. And we can never say we have a simple solution and by the one and simple solution, except perhaps seat belts. That's a very simple solution. And the only problem is how to get that being done. We have some thoughts about that, but nevertheless, that's a simple. But most of the time, these, these causes are complicated. We have to understand and to accept that it's a multifaceted problem. The second element of the nature of the problem is that it's not just one simple king of South Australia sending the Royal Road Safety Force of South Australia to South Australians and solve the problem. I believe there is no king and I know there is no uh, Royal Road Safety Force. So all these partners have to play a role. And above that, it's always the distinction between the individual responsibility and the responsibilities of these partners. And that's a very important aspect. So we cannot simply say to one stakeholder, please solve the problem. And the last 
element of this nature of the problem is the so-called low-hanging fruit. We have to stretch more and more to solutions. The easy solutions have been done already. Jack McLean here in the room gave me a couple of months ago a long list of all the countermeasures we have taken in this state already. And it were pages and pages with all sorts of measures. You have done that in the past. And now you have to move towards next measures. And that's not easy. So the low-hanging fruit or the silver bullet, I apologize to let you know, is not available. It's a complicated, it's a complicated game to play. When I come to a vision, um, I would like to understand you this. In the past, it was our habit to look at the crash like that and to ask ourselves who to blame, who to punish for that crash. Can we, can we look for um, one cause? Can we look at what caused this crash? Now, we learn more and more that that is not the right approach. It's far more better to ask ourselves how could a crash like that happen on such a road? What are the reasons behind that? And again, seldomly that's a simple reason. Please uh, remember those screens of James Reason, the Swiss cheese model. And there are holes everywhere. And we have to analyze and identify these holes everywhere. And that's the reason why we move away from the idea to blame the driver to blame the victim and to see it in a more broader perspective. And that's known as the safe system approach. And I have here a few lines from a report from OECD 2008. And these lines are, I believe, very important for the next steps also for us. Crashes will occur and road users will remain followable, notwithstanding prevention efforts. Road safety is a shared responsibility of road users and system designers and operators. Don't blame the victim. Road safety decisions should be aligned with broader transportation decisions. And this approach shapes interventions to meet ambitious long-term goals rather than relying on traditional interventions. This approach, the safe system approach, was applied in my country. And we started with this approach in the 90s. And what I would like to show you here is that from the moment we started, we needed some time to get this implemented. And here you see the different phases we applied here. If you are interested, I suggest you to go to www.sustainablesafety.nl, simple as that. There you have find a lot of background. We implemented this for about a decade and we had a result, uh, evaluation result um, about two years ago, indicating that this result, uh, this approach reduced the number of fatalities with 30%. And if you have some other assumptions, it can come up to 40%. So very effective indeed. And the question is, if, if we go along this line, what does it mean for this state? And here I have my recommendation. I do believe that this is the right way forward. But the challenge is to get it implemented. This approach was already adopted by your ministers of transport in 2004. And I believe the big challenge here is how to get this way of thinking being practically implemented in this state. And that's not been done yet. So people, so the Road Safety Advisory Council adopted this and said, well, this is a good idea. However, what does it mean for everybody? And that's the reason why I propose to start a task force to develop practical consequences of adopting this approach. And my idea would be to include all stakeholders in this task force, and I guess that it would be 
reasonable to expect a result in about one year time. About the safe system approach. Next step then, in my opinion, is how to get road safety being included in this broader perspective of transport. And here you have the five, the five elements of almost all models dealing with sustainable mobility. And I believe that's the future in which you include environmental goals. Of course, you are dealing with competitiveness that a, a system is working well, a healthy system, equity, the balance between the different interests. And I would suggest to bring road safety at this level. I studied your 30 years Adelaide plan and it took a while after the four the first four points to find road safety. In my opinion, it has a too low priority in that plan, and I do hope that we can bring it to that level where all the interests are uh, obeyed. We have visions for all these other areas. We have a vision how to deal with economical um, sustainability. We have a vision how to deal with healthy transport and equity. We have a vision about competitiveness. We don't have it yet for safety. That means in this approach, we integrate safety in decision making with all the other important components of transport. That means, for example, to integrate road safety in plans such as the 30 year plan and such as health in all policies. And I do believe that this health in all policy is a kind of an invitation to us to cooperate with them. That means that I believe it would be good to come out of our own road safety silo and to communicate with the rest of the world and to integrate road safety in decision making uh, as in this Greater Adelaide plan and this health plan. I come to the next part of my vision and that is the part which calls to be set and how ambitious can we be. To do that, I have a few slides for you illustrating the development over time of the mortality rate. So what I did here was relate the number of fatalities per state to the number of inhabitants, make that somewhat comparable. You see here South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria. I wasn't aware of the fact that all three states had the same pace of improvement over this decade. It's a coincidence. Assume that all these three states will have the same pace in the future. And then we have this result. And in your national strategy, you are talking about this 30% for this country. And I hear some voices saying, well, we can be somewhat more ambitious. I welcome that. However, you have to accomplish it. Uh, but nevertheless, this is 30%. As the minister said, we are still somewhat behind the best performing countries in the world. And you see that these countries, the so-called sun countries, um, that they have still the ambition to improve themselves. So that means that these countries didn't decide yet. We, um, we reached the end of, of the development, the, the, the law of diminishing returns. Now they are moving on. And I question, question you, what kind of goals could we set here? The first you can think about is why we are not catching up with New South Wales. If you are going to do that, we have to reduce the number of fatalities or the mortality rates. It's 40%. But you can make another statement, and I, and I, well, I, I present it to you. And I hope to learn the response of the road safety community and all the, all the decision makers in the future. Why we are not going to catch up with the best performing state in this country? Is there a good reason why South, South Australians couldn't benefit from the same level of road safety as the Victorians? 
And one of the lessons I learned the last couple of months is that you like to beat Victorians. <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> but, but serious. Why couldn't we try to do that in, in, in a decade time? Um, of course, we have to be realistic. I know that. But nevertheless, this, this would be my advice to those who are now developing the state strategy on road safety. See whether we can reach that level, assuming that South Australia will improve itself over the next decade as well. Okay. Move to actions and measures. I apologize for those who are expecting me to cover everything. I cannot do that. In my report, I will cover many, many items. Um, but for today, it's, it's, it's too demanding and it costs us too much time. But I have a few ideas and I would like to present them to you. And again, if I'm not covering your topic, please contact me and I certainly do it in my final report. Don't worry about that. So it's at least my ambition to cover the whole spectrum. Engineering, enforcement, education, well-known ease in the road safety community. I add to that emergency services and I would like to broaden that a little bit to health. And I go through these elements uh, step by step and give you some of my recommendations um, as I formulated them. This is uh, my own piece of work. Um, I took a map and, uh, of South Australia, of uh, Adelaide, and I asked myself, why do you have so many roads all over the place allowing me to travel all over the place, whatever I like. And I'm sometimes stopped by something, but most of the time I'm not. Traveling from A to B, I can do it everywhere. And I don't think that is a good uh, network design. I do believe that we have to build, based on a functional classification of road, a network. Be very specific. Here, I would like to prioritize transport. Here, I would like to prioritize access only. And uh, I welcome the debate um, in a few of your roads. And I recall to Prospect Road, and I've seen a discussion in Unley, uh, where people are trying to change the environment based on the functional classification. So I do believe that we need that. And the assumption here is we identify a function. It's through traffic is distributor or access. We design a road according to that, and by doing that, we try to influence human behavior on those roads. I do believe this is a great step forward if we can agree on such a road hierarchy. It's not available yet, but I do believe it's needed. As said, I do believe that we have to leave our silo, our road safety silo, and we have to move on to other areas where we can have our influence. I do believe that integration here is the key word, and that's the reason why we would like to include road safety decisions in land use planning decisions and transport planning decisions. These decisions are made every day and it's far more better to include road safety right at the beginning of these decisions than at the end of the day find out that we have road safety problems which we have to solve. So don't wait for the crashes. You can act based on the knowledge we have on beforehand. 